Welcome to season 11 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week we are talking with coach Jonathan Stokey, who is a former top 10 junior in the U.S., a former top collegiate player at Duke University, and went on to coach college tennis as well. Now he is coaching juniors on the East Coast and working with one of my all-time fave coaches, Craig Signorelli, which came out during the interview. So I was really excited to hear that. Jonathan's got a great bank of knowledge about not only developing junior players, but also helping them understand what it takes to play collegiate tennis and what college coaches are looking for. And he shares a lot of that wisdom in this week's episode. Before I bring him on, though, I want to just give you a quick reminder. If you haven't joined us as a premium member, I hope that you'll go to parentingaces.com and click on the join button. Also, if you are interested in having a one-on-one one -on -one consult with me, you can do that as a premium member, but you could also just purchase a consult a la carte through the shop tab on our website. So I love meeting you guys and having these consults and helping you through this journey. Please reach out if there's any way I can help you and your family make it a better experience all around. All right. For now, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Coach Jonathan Stokey. Jonathan Stokey, welcome to Parenting Aces. We've been trying to make this happen for a bit now, so I'm glad we finally found a day and time to get this done. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's always a little nerve-wracking interviewing a, a fellow podcaster, so um, I don't know. I, hopefully, you'll forgive me any sins, and uh, we'll just have fun with the hour. It's a little nerve-wracking for me, too, because I know what I always hope my guests will give me, which are great answers that are exactly the right amount of time, so I'm very <laughs> I'm very aware of that as well, so, so hopefully, we'll do a good episode. There we go. So whenever I have a new guest on the podcast, I like to give them the opportunity to share a little bit of their story, how they got started in the sport. So what's your tennis story, Jonathan? So I moved uh, to Chapel Hill, North Carolina when I was eight years old uh, from Long Beach. So I grew up in Southern California. My dad played baseball and that was what I did. I played baseball. I played a little bit of everything, but mainly baseball. And when I moved to Chapel Hill, uh, we became a member of a local country club and I was on the swim team and I saw a tennis court one day and just said, Hey, like, let's just go try it out. So I actually gripped, I went out on the court and gripped my racket like a baseball bat. So I had two hand forehand, two hand backhand. It was actually two backhands. And I just started hitting the ball back. And I was like, man, this is great. Like, what do you, now what do you do? And someone said, well, you enter a little state tournament. So two weeks later, I entered a tournament and I won a couple matches and I was what? hooked. Yeah, I was hooked. I mean, I learned very early. Uh, if you just make a couple balls, you can do pretty well. Yeah. So I would, I would just throw it in play. I'd hit slight little two hand slices and I would just run everything down. And so I loved it. And then after about two or three years, you know, I kind of was like, well, if I want to be a high, high end junior, I probably need to focus on this a little more than just twice a week or three days a week. And so I kind of fully committed to it. And uh, how from old there, were you, you know, at that point? Uh, it's probably about 12, 12 or 12 and a half. I kind of gave up baseball. I gave up, you know, I played basketball in the off season and I was kind of like, you know what, I want to be good and I really like tennis. So let's just do the one sport thing. Um, so yeah, that was about, I probably started playing tournaments when I was 10 and then only tennis by the time I was about 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. Um, and so from there I became, you know, a good junior. I had a lot of success in doubles playing with Rajiv Ram. Um, obviously if you have a partner like that, it's pretty tough to do poorly. Uh, but you know, we did well and, uh, had a good junior career and then ended up playing at Duke and that was, God, it's getting farther and farther away now, but 2002 to 2006. Okay. Um, and so had a great experience there, played for Jay Lapidus. Um, uh, we won a couple ACC titles, made a couple sweet 16s, always in that top 10 range, uh, which was a blast. So for me. I went to a school that was top 10 in tennis and top 10 academically. And so that was kind of like the goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have to ask, and, were you in the lineup from the get-go? 
Yeah. So I was, and this is always an interesting thing for parents. Now I was, you know, top 10 or 15 in the country in singles and Rajiv and I won every Kalamazoo we played. I won every clay court national that I played with different partners. And I came into Duke as a freshman. And I think we were eight in the country and I played five singles and three doubles. Wow. So I think sometimes people don't understand the level at the top of the game, at the top of the collegiate game, like you would think I'm one of the best players in the country and I was barely making a lineup mm -hmm. as a freshman. Uh, so it's pretty deep. And especially now with the international kids filling out some spots, it's very, very competitive. Um, so yeah, so I played there and I knew pretty early after college tennis, I was done. I did not want to play pro. Um, and the only thing I maybe could have done was play doubles, but the travel and it, it just wasn't for me. And so I was kind of convinced I was going to be done with tennis. And about, I don't know, junior or senior year of college, I was like, you know what I want to do is I want to coach. I, I, I love the concept of coaching and helping someone else reach their goals. And so from there, I went to Smith Stearns Academy, coached a couple of years after graduation, coached the women at Wake Forest, and then actually got the opportunity to come back and coach the Duke men's team. So that was a blast. Awesome. I have to ask you, growing up playing with Rajiv and watching the career that he had, did you ever have regrets not giving it a go on the tour? You know, not a single time. You know, so that's how I know I made a, a good choice. You know, yeah. I, I see him out there and there's the confident side of me goes, you know what? I, I don't think I'd be winning a U.S. Open, but I go, hey, you know what? I know I could have done well, but it's also not what I wanted to do. I mean, every time I have a breakthrough with a kid coaching, or, you know, you create a special relationship and I've kept in touch with players from my first years coaching, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that means the world to me. So when I see an event out there and I go, man, maybe I could have won a couple matches at Indian Wells this week. Like that doesn't, it really doesn't interest me. Maybe I wouldn't have even be able to do it, but I definitely don't look back with regret. Which is so interesting because, you know, we've heard from professional players on the men's and the women's side so often that, you have to absolutely love being out there and, you know, traveling all the time, being away from home, being in different cities with different cuisine and, you know, being away from family and all of that. So I, I always find it interesting when a top junior player and a top collegiate player knows that, you know what, this is not for me. You must have been very mature at age 20 or so to know that about yourself? I would say, yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty decisive person, but what you just mentioned about the travel, I mean, that's the big unknown for me. If I mm -hmm. wasn't going to make it as a player, that's the part I wouldn't have been able to stomach, you know, mm -hmm. being on the road for that long and being away. I'm a homebody. I do not like traveling. And so the respect I have for a, a tennis pro who travels all over the world, living out of a suitcase, very short off season, like that is the to me, what would be the hardest part of being a successful pro. Interesting. And so you went back to Duke and coached there for several years. And I mean, the Duke team is always a powerhouse team. They're always in contention for national titles, which is awesome. You decided to leave college tennis and go back and coach juniors. What precipitated that decision? So I coached at Duke, I coached at Wake Forest for two years, and then I coached at Duke for 10. And it was like the quickest decade ever. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't believe it was actually 10 years. Um, and we had great success. You know, early on, we made a couple of lead eights kind of on the front end of my time there. Coached a ton of All-Americans, all ACC players, and, you know, coaching at the school that you went to. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an amazing experience. Sure. Um, but I think after 10 years it was, you know, every year is kind of the same. You go through your recruiting cycle and then a new kid comes in and you, you kind of work on similar things and you're going to play UNC every single year. And, you know, I kind of actually left during uh, COVID when COVID cut the season short. So that was 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of felt like I needed something new and fresh to kind of get me going. Uh, I had a couple of friends down in Charleston, which is where I am now. And, you know, I kind of asked around too to a bunch of college coaches. I said, hey, do, you know, do you guys miss it? And most of them were like, mm, not, you know, not really, you yeah. know, some of them stayed in tennis and got back in juniors. Some of them left tennis, but um, they kind of gave me the confidence to, to try something new and, and not be afraid to leave it. Um, but I love, you know, what I'm doing now with junior tennis and um, 
I think it was Chuck Creasy who told me once when I was asking him, you know, he said the difference between a junior and a collegiate player is that junior player is like wet clay. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the college player is kind of closer to dry clay. And yeah. so you can really see your impact on a junior a lot of times more so than a college player. Sure. And, and I've definitely seen that in my two years back in the junior, junior world. Interesting. And so being a college coach, obviously, for as long as you were, you learned a lot of things about coaching and what it takes to help a player transition from being a good junior player to being a good college player. Now you're kind of going the opposite direction. Now you're shaping the junior players to be ready to play in college. What did you learn as a college coach that has helped you be successful as a junior coach? So in the recruiting process, and then also, you know, kind of seeing what won at, you know, the top of D1 men's level, I can tell you any type of style will work. I've seen big servers, you know, six, six guys, five, six guys, it, pushers, slappers that you can do well with a lot of different things. But generally speaking, you have to have a really good head on your shoulders if you want to be at the high, high level. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I know juniors don't focus on. You know, if you said, hey, you're coming to the courts today, what are you working on? They'll say forehand, serve, transition game. Very few of them go, hey, you know what? I want to learn how to be an amazing competitor today. Mm -hmm. And that's what every college coach wants. If you ask anyone, they go, what do you want out of your guys or girls? I want competitors. And that's a skill. It's not a personality trait where you go, some people have it, some people don't. Um, so we spend a lot of time now where I am at Snee Farm in, in Mount Pleasant and trying to teach them how to be competitors, how to problem solve on the court, how to manage their emotions. Those are things that you need to be a good collegiate player. Of course, I'd like them to have a great serve and a great return and all those things. But every player is different. They all have their strengths. And if you can hit the ball at a, at least an acceptable level and you're an amazing competitor, then you can do really, really well. I love that you said that because it's something I focus on when I do consults with families, especially the ones that are going through recruiting. It's like the coaches don't care how pretty your strokes are. <laughs> you know, they, they expect you to be able to hit the ball. They expect you to be fit. They expect you to be able to move. What they're looking for is people who can win tennis matches. And it's not that you have to win every match, but you have to have that competitive spirit that you're fighting until the very last point. And, you know, people are oftentimes shocked to hear that, you know, that coaches look for that. How do you train being a good competitor? How does someone that's learn a, that? That's a really good question. Um, so you actually had a guest, uh, Josh and Carlos, a couple yeah. of weeks ago, who, who I've been in touch with for, for a while now, and, and they do a great job with stuff like this. So there, there are programs out there um, and concepts out there. It's a really, really difficult thing to train. And that's why when you get to college, you don't have 500 amazing competitors. Mm -hmm. Usually it's, it sticks out more so than, you know, if you see a guy and you go, man, that guy's got a great serve. That's much more common than you looking down at the other side of the net and going, man, that guy is an amazing competitor. Mm -hmm. um, so some things I think that you drill are just discipline, you know? So um, if as a coach, I stay on someone and say, hey, you know what? You're going to walk around with your head up. You know, having a good attitude is part of being a good competitor. Absolutely. That's, that's more just staying on a kid and being disciplined the the finer side of being competitive problem solving we do a lot of drills to create awareness so one drill we'll do is they'll finish a point and i'll say repeat what just happened to me you know can, can they even name the five shots that were hit <laughs> right. a, a lot, you know and it, it surprises me because sometimes they don't even know if they served on the deuce or the ad side and i go wow. ah, well you know what that would make sense if you don't know what side you're serving on it's probably pretty hard to pick up what patterns are happening and and what your opponent is doing and how they're feeling and, and what the score is. And so we do a lot of awareness exercises like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a very difficult thing to train and kids don't like working on it. And so that is why when I see the college kids, there is a lack of amazing competitors there. So my audience has heard this story and I, I tell it a lot when I do consults, but when my son was about 16, I brought him out to California to train with a coach who had come on the podcast and who I really clicked with. It's Craig Signorelli. And I don't know if you know Craig, but uh, I, I work, I work with Craig. Oh, you do. 
Craig, oh is, in, Craig, Craig is at Snee Farm with me in Mount Pleasant. Yeah. Uh, small world. Okay. Yeah. Well, so when my son came and worked with Craig the very first day, um, Craig would stop every time my son hit the ball, he would stop the ball and ask my son, why did you hit the ball there? What do you think is going to happen when I hit the ball back to you? Where's it going to go? Where's your next shot going and why? Why did you choose that shot? Why did you choose that spin? And after about 90 minutes of that, my son came off the court and I was like, are, you know, are you tired? He's like, I'm fine, but my head is about to explode. He was so like mentally drained from doing that exercise over and over and over again. And it was the first time anybody had asked him those questions and made him really think about the why behind his shots. And so I, that's so funny that you and Craig coach together. Um, I guess this is, this is one of those things that a lot of coaches miss out on doing with their junior players. Yeah. It, it's much easier to just hit balls and sure. in a way, in a way technique can be a touch easier than that, but also, you know, kids in the beginning, if you ask them to think about things, it's very overwhelming, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I would say if you were trying to teach a, a 10 year old calculus, they'd probably be like, Oh my God, well, how, how do you think about all these things? But you know, as you get older, you know, I could probably come up and think about the last four points I played in the deuce court, where I served, what they did, what worked, what didn't, how my opponent's feeling, all those thoughts can go rushing through my brain with almost no, no conscious power. It's happening mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. But if I was working on that when I was 14, yeah. I'd be going, oh my God, you, you're making me think about all these things. And, and I would feel exactly like your son felt. And it's a really uncomfortable thing. And so kids usually just go, hey, can I just not think and hit? And, <laughs> and you, you kind of go, yeah, that's, that's an option. Yeah. But then all you're going to be is a hitter. And right. what happens when someone hits better than you? Now you're kind of toast. So yeah. it's a necessary skill, but it, I, I can totally see where your son got exhausted that day. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's one of those things that, like you said, there are a lot of kids that hit the ball really well. A lot of kids that move really well around the court, a lot of kids that are, you know, doing the fitness work and can stay out there for two, three, four hours if necessary. But the ones that understand the geometry of the court and attack a match like a chess game where you're having to think, you know, three, four moves ahead are the ones that begin to really separate themselves from the rest of the pack. And we, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, that's something we try to stress because to me, that's the fun part. You yeah. know, if I come out and I just serve better than you, that's great. I worked on my serve, but to me, the joy of beating someone who hits the ball better than me is at the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. I go, man, that person serves better. They move better. And they just left with a loss and they don't even know how it happened. And I don't think kids value that skill enough. You know, they value the serve, they value all the things you can see, but if they win a match and they didn't hit it well, they say, well, I didn't play well. And I always remind them, I said, maybe you didn't hit it well, but you played great. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a difference there. And I, I think we have to make sure that kids and, and any type of tennis player just remembers that that competing is a very valuable skill. Well, not only the kids, but the parents too, right? Because, you know, at parenting aces, we focus a lot on development and, you know, long-term development, not just focusing on results, but really working on getting better every time you do something relating to your tennis, whether it's getting on the court and hitting balls, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's reading a book or watching a professional match on TV and doing some analysis that way, whatever you're doing, if you focus on getting better every day, eventually you're going to be your best tennis player, whatever that is. And, and of course, everybody's different in that regard. But I think we've, because we have such easy access to ratings and rankings and all of this stuff, we've become so hyper-focused on winning and losing and ranking points and, you know, where am I rated in, in comparison to everybody else in the draw in this event? And well, maybe I'm going to pull out because this tournament's not going to help my ranking or not going to help my rating. But if they're focusing on becoming better competitors every time they play a match, then there's something different to work toward. And I have 
to feel like that's got to take some pressure off the kids. And I know for sure it takes pressure off the parents. What are your thoughts some, on that? You know, one interesting thing I'll tell you, and this is specific to me as a college coach, I, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know that I didn't really care if kids won in juniors. So they all think when I'm there watching their match and I'm the Duke coach, I'm wearing my Duke stuff. Oh my God, I better win this match because yeah. he's watching. I don't know what one random match in Mobile, Alabama is. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter to me. Like I, I'm looking at the kid and I go, okay, of course they have a certain ranking that's at least in the ballpark of what we're looking at. Yeah. After that, I'm going, does this kid compete? Is this kid an athlete? Is this kid going to be able to improve? Because I don't care if you're winning when you're 16. I care what you look like when you're 18 to 22 and if you're going to have the ability to get better. And also if I'm going to enjoy spending four years with you. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I, this is going to be my clip of this podcast. I'm just telling you right now, because <laughs> I, I say this to parents all the time. And even when I talk to kids that are going through recruiting, I'm like, don't freak out when a coach is watching you play They They could care less if you win the point, lose the point, win the match, lose the match. They're trying to get a feel for who you are as a person, as a competitor. So you just validated everything that I've been saying. I love it. The, Thank you, Jonathan. The, the, the most extreme example that I can give you is uh, my first year at Duke. So 2010, we played spring break at Pepperdine. And so mm -hmm. we played Pepperdine and Cal. We lost two deciders, four, three in the third, back-to-back -back days. I hopped on a red eye, went to Mobile, Alabama, and I watched a player, his name was Josh Levine. And he lost 0-0 at 8 a.m. the next day. I was exhausted. And I was like, oh, God, like, you know, I flew all night and this kid got drubbed. And his dad was like, oh, okay, so I guess we can cross Duke off the list. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, why? And he's like, well, he got killed today. And I'm like, yeah, he had a bad match, but we're watching him for a reason. Like, whatever, it's fine. Like, yeah. I'll watch him in the backdrop. And he ended up playing for us. And he played five or six singles and he was awesome. He was one of our best competitors. He just had a bad day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I always laugh now because I, I see it. I hear it from my kids now, how they think these college coaches are talking. And I'm like, I hope you guys trust me, but they're, they're probably not stressing about your match as much as you think they are. Yeah. You know, they're, they're thinking about where they're going to go for lunch and, and what you look like. And they're not, you know, tied up in the, did you win that tight three setter? That's not going to make or break you for sure. Right. Right, right, for sure. So let's get back to training junior players how to be better competitors. Can you kind of go through what a typical day would look like on the court with you and your junior players, helping them become better competitors? I, let's not talk about, you know, fixing strokes and, and that kind of thing, but but what are you saying to them or what specific types of drills are you doing with them to help them develop that skill? So one part of being a great competitor is at least knowing who you are, right? So with each player, we try to make them hyper aware of what do I do well? What do I not do as well? How do I get myself into patterns where I'm using my strengths and how do I avoid my weakness? And it sounds so simple, and yet you'd be stunned how often people don't know what, the, how they really win. You know, they go, oh man, I once, I, I came to the net. That's why I won. And they came to the net 10 times and you go, well, you won 50 other points. What about those 50, <laughs> you know? And, and so that's one thing we'll really do with each kid. And then, you know, there are a couple patterns, you know, obviously, you know, making a first serve is, is much better than hitting a second serve on a big point. And sure you know, att attacking second serve returns. That's something that almost every pro is trying to do. And especially in juniors, there's plenty of weak second serves out there. So there's certain patterns like that that could apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing we'll do, you know, if you if you play a game, we maybe give them extra bonus point if they attack that second serve. And we try to drill habits and let them feel comfortable with those patterns. But, you know, I think the first thing is making sure you know who you are. And then kind of going to that tournament tough with Carlos and Josh, it's really learning how to focus on that other person too. Mm. And how, what is your opponent doing? Where do they look comfortable? How do they look uncomfortable? You know, what's the score and how are things going? I think that's kind of that next level that you progress to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we talk a lot about that and very rarely in a group setting would we ever go, hey, you know what, your forehand, let's, let's take it back like this. It's a lot more, why did you choose that shot? Would you choose something different? Are you happy with your choice and try to get them to be accountable for how they think? 
-hmm. And once they have that ownership is kind of when they take off and go to that next level. So one of the questions I get a lot is how do you know when a kid is ready to move up to the next level of tournament, right? So we all know, you know, with the USTA structure, you know, for those in the US, um, basically you start at a level seven or level six when you first start playing tournaments and you work your way up to level one based on how well you're progressing and how well you're doing at events and, and all of that. But from your perspective, Jonathan, as a coach who is, training kids to hopefully play in college. What are you looking for that lets you know a kid is ready to move up from, let's say, a level five to a four or four to a three? You know, I'm sure you've heard like some coaches say uh, you should be playing 50% of your matches at someone around your level, 25% above and 25% way below. I mean, that's a great benchmark. So if you're in an L5 and you just won one and one four times in a row, okay, then maybe that's you know, too low of a level for you. Mm -hmm. um, I like, I honestly like my kids to win a little bit in the beginning though. I, yeah. I do think winning, I think winning is important for confidence and enjoyment. I think some kids like to play up because there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. I'm playing someone older and it's okay if I lose. And I get that it, it's much more fun to play without pressure, but it's also not reality. Um, so I think it's that blend. And I think every kid is different. One thing, uh, the very first episode I did was with uh, Jesse Pagula on my mm -hmm. podcast. I grew up with her. And so I saw her when she was seven, eight, nine years old. And now she's obviously a top 20 player in the world. And I asked her what she would have done differently. And she said, I would have played my own age group much longer. Hmm. So she said, I played up, I got killed all the time. And I was playing against a good ball, but I really wish I had just dominated my age group first and then moved up to the 14s. And if I could dominate that, then move up to the 16s. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with her 100%. I think it's very important before you move up a level to make sure that you're already succeeding at a high level at, the, at where you currently are. Well, and the reality is that when you get to college, as a freshman and with all the crazy COVID stuff, you could be playing people six years older than you as a freshman, right? No question. So, you know, there's a different kind of pressure at that level where you're playing for your school and your team is depending on you to compete well and do well on your court. Um, but you do have to get used to playing in those situations with pressure, because even if you're playing somebody six years older than you in college, I guarantee you the pressure is absolutely the same as if you were playing somebody your same age, because in college tennis, age doesn't matter. Exactly right. And, and lineup spot doesn't matter. So you might think, oh, I'm playing five. And so, oh my God, I'm playing their fifth worst player. Oh my God. Well, one thing I used to always tell my guys too, is like, we had some teams that were very bunched up. So our number one was very close to our number six. Mm -hmm. And so on any given day, our number five might've been our best player on that particular day, the way they all competed. Yeah. But the opposing team would go, oh, I can't believe I lost to Duke's number five. And I'm like, well, honestly, he was pretty good today. Like our number <laughs> Our, our number one wasn't all that that much to write about, write home about, but you know our number five was great. So kids get tied up in the numbers, they get get tied up in the age, um, and really at the end of the day, it's just a ball coming back at you, right? So you just got to learn to compete. Uh, but I always found that funny the the lineup spot thing, and yeah. you know, oh, he's a senior, you know, all these things that really just don't matter. Exactly. Really gets in their head. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so your philosophy with choosing tournaments is dominate your age group. Um, when you're, if you're going to tournaments and you're killing it all the way through the draw, maybe it's time to move up to the next level, but that doesn't mean that you can't go back and play that lower level event. If maybe you're working on something, right. If maybe you're changing your serve or maybe you're learning a new stroke or trying to develop a new pattern or, you know, a new tactic. hundred percent. I mean, I, we work on things all the time. I'm working with one girl on her serve and, and she's a very good player and it's been going great in practice for the last two months, but I go, Hey, let's just wait till you play a tournament. You know, that's going to be a whole different beast. Like yeah. you're serving great, you know, at 7.00 AM in the morning, but just wait till you got a, a match that's going to count on your record. And so there's those little baby steps. Like, can I do it in practice? Yes. Okay. Can I do it in a practice match? Yes. Can I do it in an L5? Yes. Can I do it against a really good player in an L2? Yes. 
and you keep believing in yourself more and more. And for each kid, that process is different, the amount of time it takes, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely, you know, a part of the process. If you're working on something, I wouldn't suggest going to an L1 and working on a new forehand. <laughs> like, I don't know how that's going to go. And that's just going to kill your confidence. Right. Right. One thing you just mentioned, practice matches. And, you know, I hear this from junior coaches. I hear this from college coaches more than I can count. American kids do not play enough practice matches. What is your philosophy around practice matches? How many times a week, a month, should kids be playing them? Who should they be playing them against? Should they be in lieu of drills or in lieu of a private lesson or in lieu of a tournament even? You know, it's so specific to a player in a situation. If you have the ability to find people to play matches with, it would be great to get, in my opinion, at least two in a week. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how many days, if a kid plays six days a week, you go, cool, get two matches. Because then those other two practice days after, we can, we can go, hey, your serve out wide was a little subpar. Your first balls need a little work. You were amazing coming to the net. And then you can build your practice plan around that. And then you go play another little practice match that counts. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say, you know, I had a little challenge ladder when I was at Vandermeer growing up. And it's stupid. It was a, a sheet of paper with our names in order. Yeah. And, and that thing made me so nervous. I grew up so, with that too. Yeah. It was yeah. awesome. So when we played practice matches at Vandermeer, I was like, oh my God, if I lose this guy, I'm going to be the second name on that sheet. And everyone's <laughs> going to look at that sheet. And so it felt like a real match. And so I got a lot out of it. You yeah. know, it felt, it felt very real to me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, you know, not only playing practice matches, but not just going, ah, oh, it's, you know, it's just a practice set, you know, it's yeah. okay. You have to really feel that because if you want to have it translate to a tournament, that's, that's, what's going to work for you. And playing practice sets or playing practice matches or a combination of both. If you have the time, play a match and make it count. Cause you know, every kid's looking for that out, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I just lost a set, but you know, it was just a set or yeah. I just lost uh, a couple tiebreakers. You know, no one wants that official, I won or I lost it. Mm -hmm. um, so make it real, you know, get two sets and at least a breaker, if not a full three sets. And, uh, but a lot of times kids don't have the time. They go to real school and they get out at 3.30. You know, they don't, they can't have the online option where they're, they're a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they don't have that option, then great, you play a set. But if you can make it two or a best out of three, even better. So in your opinion, what would the perfect week look like in terms of drills, private lesson, practice matches? Ooh, that's a good question. The perfect week. I'd probably say a match. I'm going to go backwards, probably a okay. match on Wednesday and a match on Saturday. Okay. With Sunday, Sunday off. And then, you know, Monday and Tuesday, you're working on things probably in a group setting from the Saturday match. Mm -hmm. And Thursday and Friday, you're working on things from the Wednesday match. And maybe one of those days is a lesson, maybe two, if you have the means or the time, um, but you can get a lot done. And honestly, with a coach, and as far as lessons go, if you have a coach who's invested, you can get a lot of drills done on your own. Mm -hmm. I don't have to stand there and watch you take your practice swings with your forehand and take, give you seven lessons a week. I can give you one and say, here are your five drills. Now go do all these reps on your own and at home, take videos of yourself so that you can do it on your own and not, you know, break the bank, taking a ton of lessons. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for me, it would always just be reacting to what's happening. I, I played a match. I saw what worked. Let's go to work on that skill next week. And then we play the match on Saturday. Okay. Did we see improvement? No. Do we need to tweak the drills or do we just need to give it more time to cook a little bit? Um, but I think that kind of rhythm would be good for, for an average week. As far as number of hours, that's so dependent on, yeah. on your school and your flexibility. But all I can say is I think most kids these days, they play more than I think they should. Yeah. I would, I would want it to be I'm less hours, yeah. less hours, but more intense. Like growing up, I played about an hour and a half to two hours a day max. Mm -hmm. I see kids playing for four and they, they don't do a good job for four hours. They do a good job for two. And then two of the hours are, are so-so. I'd much rather just see a really hard focus too and then get on with your day. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. And I think, you know, that's why we're seeing the prevalence of kids pulling out of brick and mortar school and looking for alternative school because they think they need more hours on the tennis court. 
And I, you know, I'm not a coach, but I've been around this game my whole life. And I'm a huge, huge proponent of, you know, be on the court for fewer hours, but make those hours really count. The intensity mm -hmm. level has to be there from ball one to ball whatever at the end of the practice. And if it's not, then it's just a waste of time. Well, that, and I would also say as a college coach, if I recruit a kid who started playing when they were eight or nine and they mm -hmm. play three or four hours most days a week until they're 18, they generally don't show up to Duke very enthusiastic yeah. to practice. And, and that's when you want them to be hungry. So there has to be that balance of enough time on court to get good, but also not too much where you can maintain that enthusiasm and really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Well, two things you just mentioned, and then we're going to wrap things up. But um, one of the things you just said when we were talking about how much time on the court with lessons versus drills versus practice matches is affordability. And we all know that our sport has become super expensive. And I, I just, I feel like we, we can and have to do better in terms of providing families a more affordable way to pursue this sport and get good in the sport. I know, you know, this is something that's important to junior coaches and, and kind of the flip side of that is junior coaches have to be able to support their families. So you guys have to get paid and make a living, but at the same time, you know, we have to find a way to make the sport attractive and affordable to everybody that wants to play it. Do you have any thoughts on how we can tweak things in our junior development system in this country, especially to help families make this less of a burden? It's a great question. I think you know, if I look back at how I grew up and things were still expensive then, but I spent a lot more time hitting on my own. So I would, I would call up my friend and go, Hey, can we play a match on Wednesday? And I didn't have to pay a dime for that. We could go to a yeah. court and play. And then it puts the responsibility on me to give feedback to my coach. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't there watching going, Hey, you need to work on one, two, and three. I had to go to him and actually figure it out and go, man, I think my serve wasn't great. And he would ask me questions. And so I think that's one thing is, you know, kids need to be more willing to hit without their coach there. Mm. And I know that's not really solving the problem because the coach in there, but it's the reality. I think now kids think they have to always have a set of eyes on them, yeah. telling them what's going on. And ultimately they're gonna have to tell themselves what's going on when they play a match. So that's a valuable skill. And then, um, you know, like I said, from an affordability standpoint, clinics are usually much cheaper than lessons. Right. And in a clinic, you're probably working more on point play and more on strategy and more on competing. And by the way, I think that's what all coaches want in college. So if you go, man, I, I got to take this lesson because I got to fix my serve. If your serve is really weak, then sure, you might need to take a few privates. But really, I would stress being a competitor, and that usually happens in that group environment when you're around other kids and you're playing winning and losing games. And so if you build that skill up on your own or in a cheaper environment and just sprinkle in the privates, I think the financial side becomes a little more manageable. Yeah, that's great advice. And, you know, again, families are always looking for ways to, to do this and, and not have to mortgage their house or not have to you know, take on a second job or whatever it is. And um, I, I think we've done a disservice to the sport, making it as expensive as it is. But at the same time, I respect the fact that you coaches are trying to do the same thing. You're trying to support your families too. So there has to be a balance there. And um, I think you had some really solid suggestions. I hope people pay attention to that and and start implementing some of these ideas that Jonathan's throwing out. Last thing I want to ask you about, Jonathan, is when you have a player, a junior player, that is starting to go through the recruiting process, what advice do you give them in terms of marketing themselves to college coaches? So it's kind of similar to what I already said, but what is a coach looking for? They're looking for a great competitor. So go out there, maximum effort, uh, super focus, great body language, someone who looks like they're enjoying being out there. That's number one by far. If I see a kid and they got beautiful strokes, but they look like they don't want to be there, I'm already worried. Mm. Um, you know, most coaches want someone who can move well, 
So we focus a lot on footwork. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing too is just making them aware of how college coaches think. You know, oh, that, that coach didn't respond to me. You know what? Uh, they're busy. You know, they're worried about yeah. their own team and it doesn't mean anything about you. You know, I know you think that they're just thinking about you all the time because you're thinking <laughs> about your favorite school, but, but they're not. And it doesn't say anything about you as a recruit. Um, the other thing is coaches are unpredictable. You know, when I was getting recruited, like I said, I was a top 10 singles player. I was with Rajiv, the number one doubles team. And I was looking at an academic school that was also competitive. So for me, it was Duke and Stanford. Mm. Duke really wanted me. Stanford told me I could walk on. And I couldn't figure it out. Why, why wouldn't Stanford want me? I still don't know. I just know that I, I just know they didn't, you know, and, and that particular coach wasn't interested in me. And so players now they go, oh, but I'm in this range. I'm this UTR and I'm this tennis recruiting. So why is that school not, mm -hmm. you know, why, why are they looking at that kid? I, I have no idea. Maybe there's a connection. Maybe it's from a local place, but coaches are unpredictable. And so the less you think about them, the better. <laughs> the only the only predictable thing about these coaches is they're all looking for very similar things. And at the top of that list, it's a good competitor with a good attitude that can be coachable. And so I would go out and I would obsess about that and not obsess about the result of the match or how good my serve was and just put all my focus into competing the best I could. End it with that, because that's such great advice. And I, I want people to really think about that, especially those of you who have kids going through recruiting right now. And I talk to you guys all the time. So I know the questions that you have about this process. But I think paying close attention to what Jonathan just said about what coaches are looking for during recruiting is gold. Um, you know, hang on to that. It is super, super important for your kids to understand that coaches want great competitors, period. It's that simple. It's, it really is not more complicated than that. Well, Jonathan Stokey, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's um, I'm, I'm breathing a sigh of relief. We got through this. We had a little dog barking in the middle, but it's okay. Um, but thank you so much. And I look forward to doing this again sometime because I sense that we only scratched the surface in terms of the gems that you have to share with the Parenting Aces audience. Hey, hey, I told you I, before show, I'm, I'm a coach. I can talk forever about tennis and, and getting people better. So yeah, whenever you want me back on, I'm, I'm here. Awesome. Well, thank you. And to my audience, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.